Um, we know Buzz from Apollo 11, part of the first crew of human beings to set foot on the surface of another world. But there are other things we think less about. We don't know Buzz for his extraordinary West Point education. We don't know him for the 66 missions he flew in Korea in defense of his homeland. We don't know him for the PhD he earned at MIT, so that, as Julia uh, alluded to, Colonel Buzz Aldrin is actually Dr. Buzz Aldrin. And we don't know Buzz for his first flight to space, the Gemini 12 mission, which was the capstone of the Gemini program, when Buzz logged an accumulated, a cumulative five and a half hours of extravehicular activity or spacewalk, which was a record at the time. It was only after all that that he concluded it might be nice to get my boots dirty with lunar dust, too. So it's one more reason I enjoy being in Buzz's company. I was pretty lucky, too. Well, yes, it was all, there were a lot of circumstantial But, but a pioneered neutral buoyancy underwater. That's right, yeah. The spacewalking. Yeah, the Scoop 30. Diver. Yes, that's right. It's the, the spacewalking neutral buoyancy tank, the, uh, the rehearsal lab, simulation lab for weightlessness at, uh, at the Johnson Space Center. So we're here today to talk about a lot of things, but also to premiere a new virtual reality experience from 8i, distributed by Time, uh, Time VR and Life VR. Um, it's Buzz's idea for cycling pathways to Mars. So I'd like to begin by asking Buzz a little bit about the VR experience. Look, we could see a flat screen, two dimensional mm. uh, rendering of exactly the same information. What was it about VR that made you want to invest the time and energy capital to participate in this project? They asked me to do it. <laughs> <coughs> we no, can go I had, on. I had seen uh, holographic views in 3D, uh, but I had participated some uh, in, in uh, uh, walking a little bit on the moon, <clears throat> or on Mars, and the, uh, the perspective that you get is just amazing uh, when you're putting things on and you're moving around. Everything is is really changing. Right. Uh, it's far better than any put the glasses on uh, 3D yeah. film. It's just amazing. And, uh, and uh, I'm not sure how exactly we're going to put everybody in a position in a theater. It, uh, it, it's sort of uh, a one-on involvement right now. Right. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure the people who uh, putting it together don't want me to say that <laughs> because it, it is so realistic and uh, I just hope that we're able to get it to a point where <clears throat> everyone can see something as it's happening right well I think or how uh, we're dreaming it right and they will I think the the good folks who are making this happen will tell you that a lot of the answers to that are in augmented reality and and other kinds of more uh, co collective experiences but Let's get a little bit into then the, the, the content of the, the VR experience. You have criticized uh, what you've described as the flags and footprints model no. of exploring, or you we, have found short. We did that, and right. people said, no, that's just a. Well, can, we uh, can you tell folks what that is, although the name is sort of self explanatory? But what is flags and footprints, and why does that have limitations? Well, it means that as a nation, uh, we don't care too much about the science or the geology or how long you're going to stay or what you're going to eat. We just want you to go there, put a flag down, and you know nobody said anything about saluting the flag. That was my idea, but <laughs> <laughs> but it, it symbolizes an expedition. You go there and you come right back. That's not. Uh, the way we want to venture outward at all. Uh, so it's sort of a degrading term to say, we don't want any more of this flags and footprints. 
So what do we want then? We don't want flags and footprints. How do we improve on that? Well, there are certain times when you can go to Mars. It's a conjunction time every 26 months. <clears throat> and you leave before that time, leave the Earth, and you get there a little bit after that And time. this is when the Earth and Mars are in the best yeah, alignment. The conjunction the is when the Sun and, and Mars and the Earth catches up with it. That, and after that occurs, the next time the Earth goes around twice, and Mars is going around once, and I ain't quite caught up with it, but two more months, and it will. So that's 26 months is the time when you should be halfway there about. You should leave before that. If you're going from Earth to Mars, if you're at Mars and coming back, you should leave before that time and, and come back. It's, uh, it can be rather symmetric, and that leads to uh, a simplified analysis. And uh, I like to do that because I get a good uh, see of the pants feeling as to uh, what's really going on. So you, uh, we have, uh, we've talked about the Martian. It's hard not to, to bring that up in this context. And one of the things we saw in the Martian, and you've been working on this idea for long before the Martian came out, is that there is a big space liner that never really lands anywhere. It simply cycles between Mars and Earth. And that doesn't seem to be how we usually think about space travel. So when you talk about cycling pathways, yeah. How does that kind of infrastructure come into play? Well, if you've seen pictures of Elon Musk's version of colonial transport and, and science fiction stories, if you're going to send people, it's, it's got on board this conveyance everything you need. And when I first started trying to draw a picture, what does this machine spacecraft look like that is going to do what the trajectory. The trajectory will take a point, and it'll get it where you want it. But what is a spacecraft going to look like? <clears throat> and when I first put this together, of course, I had to have artificial gravity. And that goes around something in the center. And I thought, well, I can uh, make redundancy. I just have to have another one here, and I'll send two more. And so, so just so people are it, clear it on this, so though. It's so complicated. <laughs> you would never even think of proposing this for anybody. It would be so costly. Right. But, and this is and, what we're calling the cycler, the, yeah. this major piece that simply goes back and forth. And how do we and take advantage of that? it is so much simpler. Basically, it's a cylinder with a port on the top, a port on the bottom six of them going around. <clears throat> That's the core vehicle. But <clears throat> out of the top of it is a big circular photovoltaic ar array fixed. It's deployed this way, and then it deploys out like a fan. Now, each one of these boxes had gone out six directions. They lower down radiators away from where the sun is. And it's braced struts uh, that don't interfere with using the ports. And the Nothing ports are used for your, your spacecraft with crew then <clears throat> comes up well, and docks. It's going by. Uh, you can have a spare, you can have supplies on it. But in other words, this is going out. I come up from Earth, I hitch a ride, mm. I dock with a cycler. I come out to Mars. When I get there, I come down. I go down to the surface, and the crew that's on the surface now, the comes up and hitches a ride the first cycler that uh, I wanted to look at after I had played around with Earth-Moon cyclers, where once a month, you can swing by the Earth three times and swing by the Moon once. And why do we want to go to the Moon? What's the advantage of the Moon here also? because I know we've spoken about resources. Um, I could use the word, the moon enables us to go to Mars. Essential is almost. It's almost mandatory in my way of thinking, because 
the base that we want on Mars, we will design and place it on the moon. And we will do other things like landers will refuel so they can deliver these items. And the fuel, of course. Now, who designs these? We do, the US. The US brings together five nations, US, Europe, ESA, and Russia. They have an agreement to work together at the moon, Japan, and China. Now, right now, uh, Congress has very unwisely said NASA can't even talk to the Russians. <clears throat> but I'm not with NASA. I can talk to them uh, whenever I go. And <laughs> I know other people. <laughs> So, uh, see, I have a Buzz Aldrin Institute in Florida, at Melbourne, the Florida Institute of Technology. And the last time I went over there, uh, five top people in the Chinese Space Agency, we talked for about an hour. And they talked about maybe establishing a, a Buzz Aldrin Institute there. <clears throat> you may not know this, but I'm the chancellor of the International Space University, headquarters now in uh, Strasbourg, France. Uh, first chancellor was Arthur Clarke. Uh, the next one was uh, Jean-Jacques Dordain uh, from Europe, ESA. And now I'm sure Arthur Clarke didn't really think the headquarters were going to be in Sri Lanka. No. <laughs> uh, but, uh, the headquarters is in France, in Strasbourg. Uh, summer sessions around different places. Uh, but I think it's about time to at least have the Western Hemisphere represented with a growing, at least up to a half. And I think in Florida, we got the right place to start uh, doing that. Well, when you were flying um, and when you first joined NASA, Obviously, uh, the U.S. and the then Soviet Union were at dagger points. This was a foot race to the moon. Now, not only are we collaborating with Russia, mm. but Russia is, until such time as we build new human-rated launchers, Russia is our only ticket off the planet. Um, you clearly are not a big fan of U.S. dependency on Russia. But does this seem like a, core, a good core relationship on which to build the idea of, uh, of future ambitious missions well, to Mars? A, a lot of people will call it a space race back in the 60s. Mm -hmm. I learned, and a number of us did, and I've been talking about it since then, um, this last year at the 100th anniversary of MIT Aeronautics Department, uh, before we got, people were kind of talking, and, and one old guy, said, uh, you know, uh, when Kennedy first walked into NASA, he said, uh, well, this was after the Bay of Pigs, not exactly a smashing success. <laughs> so I guess it was maybe April of 61, because he took office inauguration day after the election in 60, in uh, January uh, 20th, 1961. I remember that because that's my birthday, January 20th. <laughs> uh, I have a parade every four years in Washington. <laughs> <clears throat> so the Bay of Pigs uh, was sort of set aside. And so his speech before Congress was May 25th, 61. So sometime around April, uh, according to this, this guy at this uh, 100th anniversary, Kennedy walked into NASA and sat down and said, you know, I." We, we've got to uh, really boost our technology. I, I think we should go to Mars. Ugh, jaws dropped, and NASA, well, well, sir, I think that's maybe a little bit beyond us. Now, whether it was a Wednesday or Thursday, somebody said, uh, well, sir, Mr. President, we'll look into this, and we'll report to you Monday. And somebody said that was the busiest weekend NASA headquarters ever had. <laughs> and they said, no, it's just beyond us. Maybe the moon 15 years. Well, it ended up uh, not an egotistical during my 
term of office. Somebody said, well, it, you know, why, why don't you try a decade? Hmm. Well, a decade uh, was what we did, and we beat that. So now, what do I think we should do at an appropriate time? Soon. Inauguration date? No, that's past. We could have done something because a week later was the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 1 tragedy 50 years earlier. But we have a 50th anniversary coming up of the first landing. It's about a little less than two and a half years from now. That would be a good time to have digested, looked over plans. And I think at that time, the president could say, if he listens to me, uh, I believe that this nation should commit itself in two decades for America to lead international crews to occupy Mars. Now, there are several ways of getting to Mars. You can go at the right time, come back at the right, and you leave Mars empty. That's a visit. Or you can go there and not come back until the next people come, and you keep it occupied. That's what I mean by occupy. And the people that occupy may have a, a five-year, four-and-a-half, five-year tour of duty, or a seven-year, or a ten-year. Um, none of those are very satisfactory to me because we're going there at significant sacrifice, significant expense. And our purpose, I believe, is to settle the planet Mars. And I think that should be our objective. Now, we're not going to sell the American people, certainly not going to sell the government on that right away. But if we occupy, then we've got several years to, to fine tune that, look at exactly what we're doing. And I believe that it is so powerful to have humans, human intelligence close to Mars in orbit to control things at about a second or less time delay than it is from the Earth. How much? Well, uh, 12 years ago, we landed Spirit and Opportunity rovers on opposite sides. And they were going to last 90 days. That was about the guarantee. Well, Spirit got stuck after five years, and Opportunity is still working. So the person in charge, project manager of, of these missions, Steve Squires, just to make a point to clarify, because <clears throat> he knew they were sending daily instructions, and they were moving around each one of them. He said that in five years, with both of them moving around, what they accomplished in those five years could have been done in one week if we had human intelligence in orbit around Mars. Now, that's phenomenal because, so what you can get done by looking, telling something to do something, and then watching it, and then correcting it. What you're it talking about little, here is yeah. we would be Direct. initially based on Phobos, one of the moons, and then we could beam down Somewhere. Uh, at one Somewhere. and a half second time delay down to the Mars surface as opposed to 15, we've, 14 We've all been delay. guessing uh, that the inner moon, Phobos, uh, maybe is, is a, a, a good place. Um, what, whatever it is, and if it's Phobos, it goes around equatorial at 2.76 Mars radii. So at the moon, let's go three moon radii, because it's smaller, polar orbit. And that makes it one diameter above the surface. So we'll put a spacecraft there that's the controller, and of course, to keep in sight what is on the ground, on the surface, uh, far side uh, near the South Pole. That's where the uh, more shadowed, it's called PSR, permanently shaded regions. And that's where the ice uh, is from our detection. And we think that's where 
uh, the source of hydrogen, oxygen, and rocket fuel, liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen, is what we can then use to refuel spacecraft that are going somewhere. Okay, and I'm just going to jump in for yep. a second here because I want to be mindful oh, of the time. Point, and, the, and, the point was, whatever we find works really <laughs> well, we will then modify what we do at Mars. Believe me, I can get lost. We had a conversation at dinner last night, and I thought I could listen for the rest of the week. So I can understand. It's hard to cut you off when you're, when you're speaking, and I never want to. Um, <laughs> a couple of thoughts on this, though. Uh, the US comes up against two challenges here. We are a very risk-averse nation. Um, one of the reasons I wrote a book on Apollo 8, which is currently available for pre-order in all fine websites, um, <laughs> one of the reasons. I got nine books. <laughs> <laughs> I defer. He writes for a magazine. <laughs> I get somebody else to do my writing. <laughs> but one of the reasons that I enjoyed writing that was because that mission was a crapshoot. As you mentioned, we had just lost the Apollo 1 crew in a launch pad fire. We were a year and a half away from the end of the decade deadline. And in the summer of 1968, NASA said, Let's throw our schedule out. Instead of a few cautious Earth orbital missions, we're going to send these guys to the moon, and we're going to do it in 16 weeks, which is a fraction of what the usual, uh, usual training time is. So do you think we have the backbone, the brass, to do that now? Missions were switched around a little bit about that time because the lander wasn't going to be quite ready uh, when they expected it. But the big thing, uh, the Soviets had sent uh, a Zond around the moon and back and landed in, uh, in the ocean somewhere in the Aral Sea. And the next time they did the same thing, uh, they landed in the normal recovery area uh, in Kazakhstan. And it was figured just to a question of time before they put a cosmonaut in there. And, and they, so we advanced some of the missions. Uh, I was on the, the backup crew for uh, one of those, the third mission, and uh, Neil and I were on that backup with Jim Lovell at the time. And uh, it ended up being Apollo 8, which was going to orbit. And, and so it was uh, really one of the uh, early, one of the first, or the first uh, mission that was going to go to the moon. And it was just great to be on the backup crew for that and, and see all the planning that were going, was going into it. And it certainly uh, gave Neil and I a very good uh, prelude to what was coming next. Now, if we're lucky. The other variable, of course, is money. Now, I'm just going to read a couple of numbers here. NASA's current budget, just approved for the upcoming year, will be just shy of $20 billion, which is the highest it's been in several years. In 1965, the budget, before we correct for, for inflation, the budget in 1965 was $7.5 billion, which would be just shy of $60 billion in today's budget. NASA represented 4% of the US budget in the 60s. It is now 0.4%. Mm. Do we have the wisdom to spend the money it takes to become a two-planet species? The wisdom to spend the money. That's the first time I've heard <laughs> that it took smart to spend money. It, it takes uh, fiscal wisdom to do with the taxpayer's money what we should be doing. And you're right. That was a percentage. In 67 or whatever it was, that was the peak of Apollo. And it was 30, three and a half to 4%. Uh, and it was on a decline by the time we were able to uh, get to the moon. And it went down 1% or less, a little up for the 
space shuttle, a little up for the station, but for over 10 years, 15, it's been about half a percent of discretionary funds. Not what a lot of people think of 10, 20 percent. Uh, space program, NASA just does not get that kind of uh, yeah, it's pan discretionary it's funds. And right now, it is being spent on a lot of things. And there are three major expenses for manned space flight. It's the space station. 16 years it's been up there, something like that. Uh, the Orion spacecraft uh, was supposed to f be flying after the shuttle stopped flying in uh, 2011. And uh, it wasn't flying. It might fly 10 years after that, 2021. So that spacecraft is a little behind schedule. And uh, the rocket uh, started out as bits and pieces of the space shuttle. The tank had engines put on the bottom, payload on the top, and the same solid rockets that the shuttle had. Looked just like a shuttle except there was no airplane, and there was a payload on the top, and solid rocket engines, and engines on the bottom. That was 1970s technology. Now, when uh, in, uh, at the end of uh, 03, the, the Challenger accident was 86, and uh, Columbia. The Columbia accident was uh, February, 03. February 03. And yeah. February 1st. And the accident board was meeting, and near the end, uh, in November, they had several recommendations. One is, this is a dangerous machine. It has had lost two crews, and uh, but you can't stop. Now, they said, don't fly it past 2010, but seven years to come up with a replacement. So we stopped flying uh, after two missions in 2011. Uh, and we haven't sent an American into orbit ever since. How do we get to our $100 billion space station? <laughs> We're paying the Russian space program to take us and the price as you'd expect, keeps going up. Yeah, that's one thing. We always wanted the Russians to be capitalist, and now they've discovered <laughs> dynamic pricing. So now, uh, $60 million. Now, commercial transportation, commercial spacecraft and rockets uh, felt they could replace the uh, spacecraft and rocket that was not ready. So they began uh, competing and of course, they needed to be subsidized by the government. They just didn't do it all themselves. <clears throat> so they have been delivering cargo, uh, SpaceX and uh, Boeing. Now, SpaceX and Orbital Science have been delivering cargo. Uh, and within a year or something, SpaceX and Boeing expect to uh, be able to deliver crew. We hope. Uh, without delivering crew to Earth orbit, we're not going anywhere. That's, that's really worse than we were in April of 1961. And that, that raises another question. Because when you say, we're not going anywhere, that's a heartfelt, that's a lament. A question I've often had, and I, I mentioned this at a TED talk in Nashville, I mean in Asheville, forgive me, um, in 2012. One of the reasons that we go to space, I feel, and this is more a poetic reason, is simply because we go, because that's what we as an idiosyncratic species do. It's the same reason we write symphonies and we dance. None of that stuff keeps us alive, but it's all reasons we want to be alive yep. in the first place. Do you feel there is a safe space for that sentiment, or must it always be this is how we can 
benefit pragmatically, financially, technologically from space. You used the word safe at the beginning? Safe, well, a, yeah. a safe space for we that conversation, it, uh, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, I had a speechwriter help me out. He said, we explore or we expire. <laughs> and that's about it as far as a vibrant nation that we all assume we're part of. We're in it. We don't want to expire. We have to excel. You know, in the 60s and 70s, our education was right up there at the top. Nobody ever heard of STEM education. Yeah. But we're not up there. We're down here. How, how did all that happen? Well, um, I've been working on a think tank to try and figure out what are the things that we did right after World War II, and, and uh, what are the things that we could have done a little better? <clears throat> Unfortunately, we haven't got funded for that, but it's uh, ready, and um, a, lot, a lot of us are thinking about that. And that's going to be quite valuable. People, some people, are not going to like what we come up with, report. We're not advising NASA. We're not advising Congress or the executive, the president. No, no, this is going to be simple reports, quarterly maybe, simple, basic, educational to the American people, letting them know, understand what did happen. The reason we are where we are is not just because of the last five years, 10 years, 15 years. It really, uh, it started uh, near the end of the Apollo program, but I, I just don't want to uh, make judgments because uh, I, I sort of put this think tank together and uh, I'm letting it with very respected people who saw uh, managers and uh, 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 corporation people and government people who, who saw this program from the very beginning and are still uh, quite aware of what's going on. And we'll assemble some more people uh, and, and it will be one of the more fantastic things that I've said, hey, let's do this. Now, I want to ask you one more question, and then we will have time for audience Q&A, and I also think we'll have some online questions. Um, this gets a little bit, again, to that sort of sense of abstract human existential uplift from being in space. You were on the surface of the moon. You had, on the one hand, the opportunity to look around and experience that, that head-snapping sensation that here you were. On the other hand, you were running an engineering mission. Now, you told us a story last night at dinner, which I know you've told before, about uh, coming out uh, feet first from the uh, lunar module and having a particular protocol for closing the hatch and the way that the details of that were built into the, um, into the flight plan. Would you, I wonder if you would sort of repeat what you said last night. Okay, quickly. I knew what the checklist said. Neil had gone down feet first, so I guided him out because the hatch wasn't all that wide opening. And uh, of course, before all of this, we uh, had the backpacks on and we depressurized the cabin. And the gauge goes down to zero, and I grabbed the handle and it wouldn't open. We had to wait a little longer until the pressure got lower than the zero in the gauge, then I could open it. So just a very little pressure would... <clears throat> so Neil goes out, and now it's my turn. A little later, and I go out, and uh, the checklist said, reach back, partially close the hatch. So I said to the world, I'm going to reach back and partially close the hatch being careful not to lock it on my way out. <laughs> and Neil said, oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> there wasn't a handle on the outside. 
<laughs> and a little bit of pressure could have slammed that shut. Yeah. As Jim Lovell once said in a situation now, like that, that'll spoil your whole day. Sometimes you just throw uh, a, a phrase out. <clears throat> but the classic really, because um, I had a, a fair amount of time to think about this. Mm -hmm. Uh, once we solved the problem of being able to leave the moon, that's another story. But so it, uh, <clears throat> we went to sleep, got up, and uh, we're getting ready to leave. And uh, I know what's happening back in Houston, Mission Control. All the people in the different systems, the flight director, Gene Krantz, is going around and naming each one. And each one says, go flight, go flight. That's his name, the flight director. <clears throat> now, when he gets all of them, he says to the astronaut who's named Capcom, capsule communicator, he says, Capcom, we're go for liftoff. All right, whoever it was, I know, he's going to call to us. Now, we changed our name, and so we were tranquility base when we were on the surface. So he calls up and says, Tranquility Base, you're cleared for takeoff. I knew it was up to me to acknowledge that we got that. And the computer is counting down. So I said, Roger, Houston, we're number one on the runway. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's absurd. <laughs> We're the only people up there, <laughs> and it wasn't any runway. Um, and you laughed. Now, five, ten years later, some comedian told me that the definition of comedy is Ed McMahon, Johnny Carson talking about something routine, and one of the two of them says something just crazy absurd. <clears throat> now, they can either smile or treat it as if nothing happened if they were confident, uh, and then the audience laughs. See? Uh, so that's humor. <laughs> so uh, I found myself not able to remember jokes, but I'd be talking about something to somebody. We'd be, we'd be talking about, uh, oh, maybe the Gemini rendezvous. And I said, now, now when we get to go to Pluto, we're going <laughs> to Pluto. What do you mean, Pluto? <laughs> well, it's absurd. <laughs> okay, so I, I do that. Uh, not even a planet anymore. <laughs> uh, but, but I have been doing that just to see the smile on someone's face. Uh, and then we go right on talking about it. Those Occasionally I meet some people that don't know me that well. <laughs> and they think I'm crazy. What in the world is he saying? So, about a year, two years ago, I stopped to think, what, what is it that I'm doing? We're talking about this, and I'm sampling things. Is this something I could use? Because I'm listening to what they're saying. I've got to answer whoever it is I'm talking to. But I'm, uh, and if it meets the sniff test or whatever, <laughs> uh, then I'll use that. Uh, but what is that? I found that I am teaching my brain to think out of the box. Man, that has done me so much good <laughs> in the past 30, 40, 50 years, whatever. Uh, and it is profound if for some reason you have friends that will understand quirky things and uh, you can get by with people that don't know you. But if you can somehow train your brain to be thinking about something and looking at alternatives, how can I make something better? I feel blessed. And maybe number one on the runway means that I had some of that before somebody told me what the hell it was. <laughs> and so I put it in the last book uh, of it that I wrote. Very good. And uh, if you can cultivate that, that idea in any way of not just thinking of here's the way we did it because that's the way we did it before, and yeah, it worked then, so that's what we're going to do. And uh, uh, that's not progress. 
<clears throat> you have to expand your way of thinking into not absurdities, not risky things, but better ways of doing things. So let's, that's a very good point to break. I, wanna, I would love to take some questions from the audience, and I think we might see some streaming in from online. I'm not sure. Um, but anyone at, at that first mic? Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm a first year grad student at UT, and I'm constantly struggling and keeping my eyes on the end goal and end up waking asking myself, why am I here? Why am I doing this? So um, while you were- What were you doing last night? No, <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, you're supposed to ask questions. Yeah. <laughs> so you're known for your achievements, but I was wondering um, along the way you had many struggles, so what would you do along the way to keep yourself motivated and your eye on the prize? Your, you had some struggles along oh, the way, some challenges. Yeah, what did yeah. you do to keep yourself uh, focused? Well, it's, it's, it's in my career. After uh, Korea, I instructed, then I uh, went to the Air Force Academy when it first opened up. I was there for uh, two years, aide to the dean and faculty. Then I went from there uh, over to Germany and from there to MIT. And uh, shortly after that, I, uh, Ed White called me up the year behind me at West Point, he said, uh, 62, NASA's going to pick some more astronauts. He said, I'm going through test pilot school. I'm doing that. He says, I'm qualified. I'm going to apply. And I said, well, I can't. We're in the same squadron. And uh, I can shoot gunnery better than you can. So I'll apply, <laughs> too. But I had not chosen to want to become a test pilot. The Air Force has room for only one Chuck Yeager, hmm. not two. And I certainly didn't want to. So I didn't do that. So I was not qualified. But uh, I said, Ed, I can shoot gunnery better than you, so I'll, I'll apply too. He got picked. I didn't. But I kept trying. I lobbied NASA a little bit quietly. And I uh, worked on some things, talked to uh, other people about rendezvous, because that was going to be one of the four big objectives of the Gemini program, because we'd finished uh, Apollo, I mean, uh, Mercury. Mercury by that time. And so my timing was uh, just kind of right. So in 73, they decided to take a gamble on me. 63. Yeah. 63, yeah. And, and I became known as Dr. Rendezvous. <laughs> we had a lot of Air Force Navy competition, and uh, the term was not always a complimentary term. <laughs> uh, anyone yeah. else? Yes. Uh, first, thanks so much for being here. It's a real honor to listen to you and just be in the same room. Uh, my question was, if you could describe for us what it felt like and maybe the experience and the emotions you had learning you would be part of the Apollo 11 crew, that crew that would be the first people to land on the moon. It, it's rather hard for me to communicate that to you and have you really understand because we were going through uh, training, and uh, we lost uh, some of the astronauts in aircraft accidents, <clears throat> and uh, some things were uh, harder than others. <clears throat> and the, the normal rotation, the way things shifted around with the Russians going to make this, and Apollo 8 going to go to the moon, it wasn't supposed to be, uh, the rotation is if you got to prime and back up for a particular mission, uh, when the primary crew flies, you have a crew to the next two, prime and backup. So the backup crew becomes a prime on three, three missions later. later. Well, now just real quickly, my first assignment in Gemini was backup with uh, Jim Lovell on Gemini 10. OK, now projecting into the future, when it flew, we're the backup crew. There's a crew on 
11 and 12. So we would be prime on 13, but there wasn't any 13. Dr. Rendezvous was not programmed to fly in the Gemini program. A tragedy uh, changed, changed all of that. And uh, a number of other things have worked out in uh, So somebody in favor. in one crew perished in a yeah, plane the prime crew on nine you then uh, was killed and backup moved up and we became the backup on nine and the prime crew on 12. 12. Uh, now with the switching around of the missions, we knew Neil and I, and at that time uh, Jim Lovell was on there, that uh, there's nine and 10 and 11. Nine is gonna rendezvous in Earth orbit, 10 is gonna be, uh, we could figure out that if things worked out, we would be given an opportunity to be the first crew to land. <clears throat> so the crew assignments um, were days and days and days coming out. But, but uh, when they did finally come out, I, I wrote this in my first autobiography. I came to home and told my wife, um, we're on the cruise, gonna make the first landing. We're scheduled. But frankly, I'd just as soon be on a later one. We'd get more interesting things to do, and I wouldn't have to put up with all this speeches all around the world and everything. <laughs> Honest, I felt that way. But the choice, I knew. But I had to share that with someone close to me. I had to share that I did have that feeling. No way could I possibly turn that down. It just wasn't being a fighter pilot. No matter what you think about it, uh, so obviously that's uh, what I felt about when I was assigned. And it was a great uh, honor, privilege to have had things work out the way they did. And I'm a very lucky person. Mother flied, I mean, my mother was born when the Wright brothers flew. I got to fly in an airplane my father was flying when I was two years old. Teenager in World War II, combat, and now, after landing on the moon, now I'm working intensely on how we're gonna put people, long after I'm gone, not long, <laughs> on Mars. Now what better time could a person uh, be alive? And just. Just to add one detail of uh, things, some things being kismet, being meant to be, being beshert, as it's said in the Jewish religion. Um, your mom's maiden name was what? Moon. <laughs> Her name was Marion Moon. So there was well, something in there. Bobby Moon and I, uh, seven or eight years old, went to a lake and we were taken care of by grandmother, Mama Moon. <laughs> Not that. I mean, that's perfectly normal. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Not for me it wasn't. Um, could we see one, and we will get to another one in the house, can we see one coming up from online? Because I'm grateful that we have, an on, have so many folks watching. Uh, nope. I am being told that's not happening. Um, we will proceed with humans in the room. First of all, Dr. Aldrin, sorry. Um, you're an American hero, and I appreciate all the work that you've done to inspire people like me and the rest of the world in everything that you've done and that you continue to do that. So thank you for that. I've had a ball. Good. Great fun, <laughs> really challenging, but it's very satisfying. Back before you guys went to the moon, President Kennedy gave his famous speech and said that we were going to go to the moon not because it was easy, but because it was hard. And that inspired millions of people as well. Some people thought he was crazy, but it inspired a ton of people. And we did it. And you guys did it. 
now it feels like that has transferred more over to people like Elon Musk or yourself or Dr. Zubrin, people that are evangelizing that. And the presidents seem to talk less and less about it and the government seems to talk less and less about it. Do you think that's a positive shift? Do you think that's a positive thing for that to transfer into more of a commercial role? Those inspiring people that, you know, Elon wants to go to Mars. Mm. <coughs> no, I was in Mexico when he gave a briefing a year ago about what he's uh, hoping to be able to do, and it's, it's bodacious. Uh, <laughs> um, he's a transportation person. He builds rockets. Uh, Three or four years ago, I had uh, been toying around with cyclers since 1985 and, you know, slowly. Uh, so I felt I wanted to go over and talk to him about what his ideas might be. And uh, so Christina and I went over there and have lunch. Uh, we stood up all the time and I said I wanted to talk about the things that I've been kind of going over and maybe we could share thoughts about Mars. Uh, no, 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 we, we know how to get to Mars. We're going to build a big rocket and put a dragon on top, and we're going to go and land on Mars. And just to be clear, he, that's the name of Elon's spacecraft. He doesn't dragon. plan to put a dragon on top. He's eccentric. Oh, I'm sorry. He's yeah, not that of course eccentric. You know that. <laughs> it's not Chinese dragon either. Yeah. Not yet. <laughs> uh, so I said, uh, well, now, when your dragon lands on Mars with the people, is there going to be anything down there uh, for you to live in or do? <laughs> it seemed as though maybe he hadn't given that a lot of thought. Then he said, oh, well, for sure, we're going to send an unmanned dragon down there first. So we'll be able to, to live in that. He's a transportation person. He's not a housing person. <laughs> He's not a builder of towers. We <laughs> <clears throat> uh, For whatever value we, that has. <laughs> uh, you really need to not just go there and stay a day and come back. You can't do that. Uh, the orbital dynamics won't let you do that. You got, if you go there, you got to wait, depending on how inefficient. And if you're very efficient, you stay for a year and a half before you come back. And you got to live in something. And you got to prepare for all of that. Uh, but if you go and you come back in a year and a half, it's empty. Nobody's there. I call that a visit. Now, if you go there and you stay after a year and a half until somebody else comes, then you can go back. Now, that's Occupy. Somebody's there all the time. Um, that's not is really what you want to have happen, I don't think. You can have a tour of duty there of th five years, seven, ten years, and come back. Uh, making a... Uh, a pronouncement by a president that I'm going to send people to Mars and uh, dribble them there, and eventually somebody, when we're all gone, will uh, begin to populate permanently. It costs so much money to get people there, and every time you do it again, it's two years more. Why don't you be smart about it and build things up first? And people go there and they can do the final touches, and then they land, and the rest of them land after that. Now, that's what I think. And a few other people, many others, I think, if they think about it longer, but not congressmen, not others. It's going to take a while before, they, before it absorbs in what the purpose of humans on this planet going to another planet and turning around and coming back? No. Uh, I don't even think it's 50-50 as to whether that's a yes or no, but it's going to change. I, I can assure you, you're going to begin to think, hopefully, and you will agree that we are 
doing something so well because we've done essential things uh, and saved money by having international partners at the moon. We design things, we'll build one, maybe two landers, habitats. They'll build the rest, they'll land them, but we'll put them together and make sure they work. The landers that take them there will engineer so that we can refuel them right away so we don't bring them back to Earth and then send them back again or leave them there and throw them away. You have to be economic. You have to be wise about how you plan things into the future. We, uh, and we will be safe as possible. I can guarantee you that. And this gets to the difference between flags and footprints on the one hand mm. and infrastructure on the other. Now, I'm seeing by our countdown clock, we are at T-minus one minute and 31 <laughs> seconds before we will be uh, blasted off from this room. Um, I do want to say just a couple of things, just a word for my home team. Uh, Time Magazine and Time.com have been covering uh, America's role and the world's role in space for the better part of 60 years now. We continue to do that. We do that with our Life VR application. We did it with our Year in Space series on Scott Kelly's uh, mission to the space station. We hope that folks will stay with us in this kind of coverage. And the very last thing I want to say is one more thing about Buzz. Um, the first time I met Buzz was in 1990. Uh, I suspect you don't remember it. It is indelible for me. Um, we had a dinner on the Intrepid. Um, I happened to share a cab ride with Buzz, by which I mean I elbowed my way to the front of the line next to Buzz and therefore was put in a cab with him. We were in the back seat of a taxi going east on uh, <laughs> East West 46th Street. And there was a gigantic silver salad plate of a moon hanging over East 46th Street. Buzz was ignoring it, just talking, looking out the front window. I thought, we have had radical, radically different life experiences relative to that body. There have been so far only 24 human beings in the entire arc of human existence who can speak about the moon in the first person singular. We hope that number will change and change soon, and we will add people who can speak about Mars in the first person singular. But for today, we've spent an hour with one of those people, and I just want to come away once again appreciating that we've had that experience. Jeffrey has been at the top, at the forefront of things in space that have been moving ahead. And, and it makes me feel really good that the way things have worked out, the first people who land on Mars, they'll put things together first and they'll land. The plan I have, they will go to the moon Maybe they're 27, 20, 29, 30 years old. They will put things together from orbit. They will go down to the surface and stay there for a while. They will know what they're getting into. And when they may have agreed that this is a good idea, a national objective of settling. But before they actually make that personal commitment, they will have experienced exactly what, pretty close to what they're. Now, that is just the way it worked out by, by doing, I thought, well, Purdue made a suggestion. Now, that is remarkable that you can be able to do such a thing. And uh, I mean, to me, that alone would sell the program to any, um, almost any congressman. Well, no, not all of them. 
<laughs> but the good I, thing I is, wanted you to just get a grasp of what, how, in a way, why it's taken going to take so long. Two decades after, five decades after <laughs> planning on the moon, one decade after the president said to go. And yet, the first person who will set foot on Mars is somewhere alive in the world today. And I like to think. My that. guess is born in 2000, right around there. So Sounds good. There is some uh, incredibly cool 17-year-old out well. there today. <laughs> Thank you very much.